Yeah. So you just touched upon another aspect of who you are, which is cranial sacral therapy. It's a hard word to say. Would you, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that for me, please? How that's a part of your life these days and how is it connected to Project 100, but also how maybe you're integrating it into who you are up until this day? I would say craniosacral is one bucket of this greater, more like well-being health strategist that I see myself becoming. So I'm also certified in this movement modality called gyrokinesis. I'm almost finished with Pilates. So they're similar but different, which most people have experienced or seen or heard of Pilates. But both of these systems have their own bespoke machines that help move the body through its full ranges of motion, strengthening all of the muscles and fortifying all of the joints. Craniosacral came into my life. Like I decided to go to massage school because I just wanted to receive a lot of massages because I will within that bucket of, of chiropractors and physical therapists, I would also get massages and I would feel better, but it would be like in the same day, the pain would come back. So maybe I just need a lot of massage. I started going to massage school because massage school was $3,000 for three months. And you receive three to five massages a week as long as you go to class and you're also working on your fellow students. So I was 41, 42 at the time. And everyone else in my class was 21, 19 even. There was somebody who just finished like really young to 28. and. I thought I was only going to go for three months, get a bunch of massages, and then I'll be feeling better and I'll go on with my life. And what happened was after three months, I still had pain. I could tell that it was working and it was decreasing, but I still had pain. I was learning a lot about my body and realizing, okay, keeping that shape of being hunched over a laptop for writing the book, sitting a whole lot, wearing high heels, all those things had changed my body shape over time to a degree that it was not going to change quickly back. And so I went in for another three months. You had to decide, are you doing the next quarter? So I go in for another three months. And at month five, I still had this pain in my shoulder and hip. And yes, it was decreasing, but it was still enough to be bothersome. And one of my friends in Portland was like, you should go see my neighbor, Dave. I don't know what he does, but people travel from all over the country to see him. Like, okay, I'll see Dave. I've spent thousands of dollars seeing all these other people. Why didn't you tell me this five months ago? So I go to see Dave and of all the things I had tried at that point, like we're talking, I had already spent like maybe $10,000 on different kinds of treatments and things. And then the, the massage school and stuff on top of it. And I go to see Dave and he barely touches me. And in my mind, I'm like, what kind of bullshit is this? this is a job, (laughs) like really barely touching a human. How could this do anything? But I could tell that I felt more relaxed and I trusted the recommendation enough to go again. And when I had that second session, I experienced what's called a somatic emotional release. So soma, your body, emotional release from the body. I went into that appointment feeling like I was relatively normal. And within five minutes, it felt like he made me have this big emotion of I couldn't stop crying for the whole hour. So then I was like, what kind of warlock are you that was able to make me cry? And really within that week, it changed things for me. I'm like, okay, the pain is really going away now. And and I was like, how can soft touches do this? This makes no sense to me, even with the stuff that I'm learning. So that got me to finish massage school because the way that massage school is set up, The last quarter, you can take elective courses, and they had a craniosacral introduction course. So I went ahead and finished, and it also coincided with the pandemic. I'd finished 75% of massage school as the pandemic happened. So I had three months off to really just reflect because there wasn't a lot of strategy work going on. There wasn't a lot of, there wasn't any massage school. I was helping my now ex husband at the time with his work and just gave me a lot of time to reflect. I'm like, yeah, I want to finish this. And I think I want to also practice this. So that's what I did. So immediately on finishing massage school, you have to do something like that. You have to have what's called like a license to touch. So that could be an occupational therapist, a registered nurse, or a massage therapist. You come in to these extra additional courses. So that's the way like touch body work stuff works. 
you get massage school is like getting a BA bachelor's degree, and then you start getting master's degrees, but they're not there. It's one course at a time over four days. And then you learn a bunch of stuff. You go practice it. So I'm through like the first four levels of craniosacral and there's six core levels and there's probably 30 different courses on their menu right now. I don't think you, apart from talking about the warlock, Dave, you haven't actually like in simple terms described this for me. And also I want to know in a very innocent way, where did he touch you? Okay. Yeah. Like all over the body and that are appropriate like basically other than your boobs and your butt crack you could possibly be touched and your but is private it, places yeah but it, but does it um, yeah i understand that but is it like touch me where the pain is or is it like you pulls your toe and you have you know your shoulders pop open like it doesn't necessarily coincide with where you have the pain so i predominantly had my pain in my shoulder and my hip i'm pointing my hip and so it might be like he's touching me on my lower leg or he's touching my abdomen, my my sternum. There's just really not a lot of correlation between where your pain is and where they touch you. So I'll explain. When they, when you first take these courses, they'll bring out a toy like so it's called it's a main noise. So oh, okay. it, I'm showing Ben an energy stick. It has a little bit of metal on each end. And if I touch both ends, it makes a sound and it lights up. And if you were able to reach to the screen and hold the other end, then would it turn on? If I could touch it? Hmm. I'd like to think so, but no. Okay. Yes. I mean, that's the a, answer I mean, is no. Should, but surely is it like it's, a, it's, a, it's an electrical circuit that goes only through your body, right? So uh, that's, you, 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 knowing the word circuit is you are five to 10% of adults. Nobody really can come up with that but to create the circuit you would have to hold it with one hand and then we would have to hold our other hand together because then we are connected and even if we were in a circle with a thousand people it would turn on if it's all connected and if one pair lets go it would turn off so that tells you okay how does the body work oh the frontal part of your brain says, we're going to do this. The motor control part of your brain says, do it now. Right? Let's do it this way. And then it's down the spine. Do it now. Those messages are sent with salts and electricity. That's how that works. So that's one thing to, oh, maybe I don't understand the body quite as well as I maybe thought. Just seeing this and not understanding how that works of this just touch can create this circuit. So that's one thing of uh, some of the moves in craniosacral are closing a circuit so that the nervous system can relax and release connective tissue and muscles. But how, what, how does that, th- this is super interesting. How does that, how does, if you don't have this like thing to show a circuit being uh, closed, how, are, how do you close the circuit in a part of the body, essentially? Is it just by, by a certain just... kind of movement? It's just two hands. So it's a bit of my nervous system. I'm the energy stick. You're the energy stick. And now the pathway is closed. I, it, it's a good way to explain it. So the nervous system is sending the messages, but then it's, it's important to understand that muscle cells are also different than cells in the rest of your body. So this was new news to me. I used to think of cells as like a fried egg. You know, <laughs> nucleus in the middle, cell wall around. That's what I was taught. Muscle cells are more like a slinky. There's still a nucleus in there, but the the slinky comes together to flex and it releases to extend. So if you think about your bicep, I'm flexing my bicep. The tricep slinkies have to open. And you're talking about millions of slinkies working together to make that happen. You also, that's a little bit harder to explain. Do you know about fascia? I, I'm familiar with the fascia in my body and this sort of connective tissue that 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 can sometimes get tight and need like stretching or or released. But I would love it if you could explain it in your own words. So it's also innervated, meaning nerves and send messages through the fascia. And so the fascia is connective tissue. It's the white stuff that you see in a piece of meat that's not the muscle of the meat. It's more like packing tape in some places. So the top of your head, it's really thick back of your lower back you can imagine and feel around it's really thick but if you go to the airport and you see them wrap up luggage to go on a long trip the plastic it's then it turns Mm -hmm. your luggage 
you're wrapped up that way. So if you think about like your internal obliques are like that, your external obliques, your transverse abdominis, you've got all those layers on top of layers that are then wrapped in connective tissue and they can get sticky against each other. They can get sticky for many reasons. Overuse of being in the same shape and not putting your body through its full ranges of motion all the time, but also emotion. And that was the thing that really blew my mind and drew me into the craniosacral is I had emotions trapped in my body that I had not fully processed in the moment that I experienced them, which is way more likely to happen with neurodiverse people that I needed to have this extra zhuzh to process those emotions and let them go through my body. Okay, so two, two, two questions. First of all, how, how can you prove that emotions um, um, can get trapped in this fascia? How do you prove that? How, how, like... So I don't know totally how to prove it, but there's a quote in one of our textbooks, the craniosacral textbook, that it, and plus it just happens all the time. People have emotional releases with this therapy. It, emotional release can happen in other times. So have you done yoga training, yoga school? No, just plenty of yoga, yeah. but no training. But maybe have you ever had an experience in yoga? You had an emotional moment or somebody else you've seen have emotion come out? Yeah, okay. yeah. I hold a lot of emotion in my hips. Okay. Not to say that craniosacral is the only way to get emotion out of the body. There are many other ways. So that was my first experience when I did yoga school. They taught us. You might have students who have this emotional experience. It may happen to you. It just happens sometimes of that is finally letting the emotion come through. Okay. So because you've maybe now experienced it, you're like, okay, I have seen that happen. That is a phenomenon. I don't know how to prove mm -hmm. that that is the case. But in this textbook, the thing that convinced me the most, it's a physicist who said, okay, if we can store a symphony, the recording of a symphony on a VHS tape, that's technically a piece of plastic. Mm -hmm. Or if you could store it on a DVD, that's a piece of plastic, sound and image, then does it really, is it so unbelievable that you could store a memory and it's a tuned emotion on a piece of your liver. Mm. Is that so insane to you or in your hips? Yeah. I'm asking the question just to see what you say, but it doesn't mean I don't yeah. agree, agree with you. Yeah. Um, one of the books that's on my list, but I've not read it, but I basically know what it'll be about based on the, the, the title is like the body keeps the, the body score. Keeps the yeah. The book actually doesn't talk about cranial, but it talks about other methods like um, EDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. I've done that kind of therapy and I have had good results from it. It didn't get all of it out. It also talks about creating, say you're in group therapy with 20 other people, picking the people and saying like, you're going to be my real mom. You're going to represent my real dad. You're going to re represent my ideal mom. And you're going to represent my ideal dad and creating like a tableau of how you wish a scenario had gone down. That can create emotional release for people. So there's so many different ways. I just personally had a much more profound experience through craniosacral than I ever had through yoga or EMDR or some of the other things that I've tried that can help release emotion. Journaling can release emotion. Meditation. I just, so I wanted to circle back to the, this sort of analogy you had with the circuit device. So um, that's, that's a start. And the fascia. Yes, yeah. but in simple terms, how would you define it? So you have liquid around your brain and spinal cord called your cerebral spinal fluid. Have you heard about that? Does that make mm -hmm. sense to you? That exists. Mm -hmm. Okay. And maybe you've ever seen a baby, like their head slightly throbs like this. Have you seen that? You can see it on a baby. It's much harder to see on an adult because they used to think, I'm showing Ben a, a, a model of a skull and it's multicolored and each of the colors represent the different bones of the skull. So the one on your forehead is your frontal bone. You've got two parietal bones in the back, your occiput, so it's your temporal bones, so a lot of these your mandible and your maxilla. We do know the names of these. Now that fluid inside your brain, it's in a semi-hydraulic system and that's what makes it make the baby's head ever so slightly elongate. So I go hot dog, hamburger. <laughs> it makes your skull get slightly elongated. It's filling 
and then extending. So what that also does is while the person is on the table, it makes their shoulders and feet ever so slightly roll out and in. Okay. So as and this is happening all the time, like five to 12 so, cycles so, per minute. So just so I understand correctly, this sort of, I'm going to use the word is maybe not correct, hydraulic system or this system of, 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 of moving plates as they move will have this effect on, on, on your feet. Is that what you're saying? It's happening right now and you just are not noticing it. It's just as much as your respiratory system is a system and your circulatory and your digestive system, your craniosacral system is a system. Hmm. of this cerebral spinal fluid going around your brain and spinal cord. And it becomes a way for a therapist to tune into it to know where the restrictions are in your body. The other important thing to know is that I used to think that my brain was just a lump in my head. I knew about right and left brain, but I'm now showing Ben a model. How do I I can basically see it? Can you imagine your brain around this model and you're going through space, right? Mm -hmm. So these membranes, so the, I'm showing Ben a model of the membranes in the brain to say that down the middle of the skull and across separating upstairs and downstairs, the membranes are more like balloons and the texture of your brain is more like oatmeal. And then you have a whole other balloon-like membrane around and down the spinal cord, the fluid and then a whole other membrane. And these central membranes are more attached on the skull at the mohawk place and along the sides where your ears are, like a monk kind of thing. So in addition to being able to feel for the restrictions, we have different moves, protocols, techniques, whatever you want to call it, of, okay, stretch the membranes from this direction, stretch the membranes from that direction. And like I showed you the bones before, can you see that the bone is pink in the middle? Like these yeah. are orange, but this one is pink. Do you know the name of that bone? That it goes, your eye goes through it. It's part of your maxilla, your upper jaw. And mm -hmm. then you have a little tiny nasal bone at the end here. It's so fascinating to me. Can't you see me info dumping in front of you? <laughs> so the pink one's called the sphenoid. And most people don't know that one, but it's like the keystone of your whole head because it touches so many bones. And the only way that we as therapists can touch it is through your temples. So that's often why you rub your temples because it will influence the sphenoid. Mm. And so all these other bones, like the blue one, the frontal bone, your forehead bone, we use our third finger, whatever you want to call it, and grab underneath the eyebrows. And try to lift it. If the person's laying on the table, we're trying to lift it towards the ceiling. That's how that bone can stretch the membrane. So you're going to get around parotid. under the eye almost. Not under the eye, under the eyebrow. It's like there's uh -huh. a little bit of grip there. And it's so light. Like they also teach us, they put a U.S. nickel in our hand and it's that's five grams. That is how much pressure the little tugboat of them on the membranes that otherwise it's going to just seize up. Oh no, we're not safe. Mm. We're not changing our structure at all. Yeah. And you can so experience that. Have you ever been in a massage where somebody mashes you way too hard for that place mm -hmm. on you? You guard. That's just a natural reaction. So some parts of the body need very gentle traction or compression to loosen up. And that is what craniosacral is. Listening to the fluid, how it moves. When we can't feel it, that's where we need to work. So I would say it's now a core therapy that I, yes, there are restrictions that you want to get rid of that are maybe causing you migraines or that are part of the pattern of that's creating tension in your body that is giving you long-term pain. But it is also a way to down-regulate the nervous system. To, so when I used that word rev before, mm -hmm. that when you touch different, people feel differently. So now that I've touched thousands of people, some people come to the table feeling very buzzy, like that ampedness. Their rev is way up. And some people are very depleted and they're very down. And that sensation changes over the hour of being, having the soft touches. And I can't go into all the different techniques that we do, but there are different things to help person. It's basically just touching them with 
focused intention. 